Right, folks, it's a really good evening here. It's 7 o'clock, just gone past here in Queensland. Obviously, uh, New South Wales and Victoria, Tasmania and ACT have now joined Queensland to be on the same time zone. Our friends over there in uh, New Zealand, it's 9 o'clock, and our friends in the UK who watch the show rigid, legit, religiously, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And um, those people who are just watching afterwards, look, um, we've got a really interesting show. You can see in the, um, the main screen there, the gentleman's name is David Laws. And um, the name Laws is really synonymous with broadcasting, uh, <laughs> with the voice, but it's uh, a different type of the Laws family. But he runs his own um, law firm. It's called Talking to Flowers. The flowers don't lie. <laughs> 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 hey, they're on there. <laughs> it's, um, it's a great show that we're going to have coming up. I know David personally, and um, it's really, we've got something to talk about. David, it's a pleasure to have you here, mate. And um, oh, Jeff, it's my pleasure to be here, mate. Thank you so much for your very warm uh, invitation. And thank you, Julia, for, uh, for both of you for inviting me onto the show today and tonight and this afternoon, wherever you are around the world. And it's nice of you to join us. So uh, my privilege and honour to, uh, to jump in and have a little bit of a chinwag, have a chat to you both tonight. Well, um, I just might point out that... Um a glass of vino uh, is usually the stable diet of David. So um, <laughs> I've let the team down. I only got a glass of water because uh, I didn't know which kind of spirit you wanted me to channel. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, the reason we've got David on on tonight, of course, our show is called Dreaming the New Dream, and um, we're actually bringing forth people who've got special talents. And when I say special talents, we've all got gifts. It's just a case of sometimes they've been laying dormant and um, they just need a bit of tender love and care. And just like a flower, it blooms and comes out. And, of course, for David, it just took um, like for the three, de three decades before it started to um, pop up and say, hello, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And um, the story unfolds. It's, um, let's start, I think, it was with Dot, wasn't it, from memory? What's, the lady's name? What's that lady's name that you um, became your mentor? Denise. Yes, Denise. Denise, I love her. Sadly, she's long since passed now, but uh, she was my great teacher and mentor, as you say, Jeff. And I met her when I was, I guess, 25, 26, somewhere around that time. And um, extraordinary lady, very, very gifted and talented in the psychic arts. But she was the most nondescript lady. Like she was very, very, very earthy, very, very grounded. And if you met her on the street, you would never imagine that she was a very gifted um, psychic medium. Uh, most people, uh, like myself, I back in those days, remember those glorious days of the 80s, guys, where there was no such thing as the internet. It didn't exist. Everything was books. And if you were lucky enough to meet someone who knew someone who could tell you about a person you needed to meet or a group you needed to align with, and they were the glory days of those, of those times. Um, and I can remember becoming aware of the gift, talent, skill, ability I had to be able to tune into people's energies. And I didn't know what it was. I mean, my parents knew nothing about this work. And back in the 60s and 70s, growing up as a child, people never spoke about psychics or certainly not in the circles that I, you know, was uh, raised in. And uh, we lived in the country. So, you know, again, unless you were in, born into a psychic family, we never knew such things existed. And we didn't even know what the word psychic was. That's how it was back then. But I remember thinking to myself, my God, I, I when I reached my late teens, my early 20s, this urge within me became so strong. I just thought, I've got to, I've just got to do something with this. Why do I know this about this person? And back then I used to have a predilection for predicting pregnancies, uh, sorry, for predicting um, people's, lives, whoops, with uh, the lights going on off here, um, uh, predicting people's lives by looking at their hands. I'm not a palmist. I have never done a palmistry course, but I needed something to grasp onto so I could connect into their energy. And I used to look at their hands and I'd rattle off all this stuff. And anyway, little things would come true. It was a little bit of a fun laugh, giggle sort of a thing. But people used to come back to me and they'd say, um, David, that's that's actually come true. That's what all those things you told me. I said, what? Yeah, it's come true. I think, well, what is this? How do I how do I um, explain this? And back in those days, I remember reading books where I was uh, I was reading about people who had mentors and met their mentors and met their teachers and their guides. And I'm thinking, where's my guide? Where's 
my teacher and mentor, and I was expecting somebody like Dumbledore out of Harry Potter to turn up as my great mentor and teacher, somebody who was this you know, wise, wise old wizard with a pointy hat and the long beard and the, the robes and the scrolls of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> well, my teacher did turn up, Jeff and Julia. <laughs> she turned up. And she turned up as a middle-aged housewife. She was a buxom lady, had her hair pulled back in a bun. And Denise had three loves in life. And she loved spirituality, Winfield Blue cigarettes and Tic Tacs. And that's what she lived on. And it was hilarious. And she got wind of this young guy who was doing these readings. And she was a very quintessential Ocker Aussie lady. So uh, her English wasn't as crisp as uh, as, uh, as uh, but she was the most gorgeous, gorgeous soul and she came to me for a reading, and I'll never forget, she knocked on my door. And little did I realise that that lady, not then, not that night, but that lady would totally uh, transform my life and change my life over the long term. So I ushered her in, did a little hand reading for her, and I said, do you have any questions? <laughs> and she said, no, I don't have any questions for you, but I've got one for you in her beautiful uh, Ocker Aussie accent. And I said, oh, what's that? She said, love, who's that, who's that bloke standing beside you? I said, oh, I don't know who. She said, well, love, he's been talking to you. He's given you all your messages. I said, who are you? Oh, love, I forgot to tell you. She said, I'm a, I'm a medium as well. I went, oh, wow, how cool is that? She said, yeah, love. And she said, oh, we've got lots to tell you. And, I, and she said, we were chatting away. And then she said, love, do you mind if we go out to your veranda? Because I want to have a cigarette. I said, yeah, sure. So we went out to the veranda and she lit up another witty blue and she's standing there. This will make you, this will so make you laugh. <laughs> she's standing there. She goes, I reckon you should come to my house next Tuesday night. I said, why is that? She goes, <laughs> she said, I run a healing group. <laughs> she a healing group munching on the cigarettes and she said i run a, run a healing group and i said what sort of healing do you do healing and she said i run a healing group and she said we do readings and i showed people i take them down the path and i said oh wow she said i reckon you should come along and and she said i've got to tell you something <laughs> something and i said what's that she said that He's telling me to tell you that one day you'll read flowers for thousands of people. And I laugh. I said, that is so cool. Who is your drug dealer? Wow. That's <laughs> a ridiculous thing. She said, love, I'm telling you, I'm serious. I said, flower reading? I've never heard of such a thing. And I jokingly said, plain or self-raising. You know, she said, no, love, the flowers would grow in the garden. I knew what she meant, but I thought, what? Anyway, long story short, the following Tuesday night, I went over to her house and Oh, I walked in, oh, my God, that was in the halcyon days of the 80s when so many people used to smoke and, oh, my God, there was a group of people sitting in her lounge room and half of them were chain smokers. I could barely see anyone and I couldn't figure out whether they were ghosts or real people. I could see silhouettes sitting in the room. So it's like, oh, you are, hello, there is someone there, hello. <laughs> anyway, oh, hello, man, sit down. And, and of course, um, we did, everyone had these little bags of flowers I said, what do I have to do? She said, love, she said, just pick up a random bag, pull the flower out, hold up to your third eye, focus on it, and it'll talk to you. It'll give you messages. I thought, wow, how cool is that? So, of course, I pulled the flower out of the bag, held up to my third eye, and it never said a bloody word. <laughs> I was just waiting yeah. for this flower to talk to me. And it, uh, she said, and I said, uh, Denise, it's not telling me anything. And she, and she said, munching away the cigarette, she said, it's all right, love, you're not focusing. <laughs> I said, I am focusing. She said, you're just not focusing. <laughs> it's all right. She said, you'll be all right. And anyway, and I, uh, at the end of the night, I said, well, look, thank you. It was awfully nice to meet you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. She said, no, love, I'll see you next Tuesday. I said, oh, do you want me to come back? Love, she said, I'll be your guide. I'll be your mentor. Now, do you know what, guys? I've got to tell you, all jokes aside, that lady was phenomenal. Her house became my church for the next two, two and a half years, every Tuesday night without fail. Uh, but luckily, uh, <laughs> the smoke, smoking room was out the front. We even had, they had a smoke before we went to do the healing, and that was out the back, and there were no cigarettes permitted out there or no drinks or no alcohol, which was funny. So, uh, But that's how it started. And now that lady taught me so much, and sadly she uh, departed this mortal coil around about 16 years ago now. But uh, she was an amazing lady, very gifted, talented, very much old school teaching. And a lot of her teachings have just stuck with me. And I, I bring those through in a lot of my workshops today. So it's just beautiful. Right. So um, amazing story. I think we just Sorry. need to explain to people in the background to um, mediumship and clairvoyance. I mean, um, 
teacup readers, uh, perhaps doing the tarot card, playing cards, throwing the bones. Um, psychometry in the sense of picking up an object uh, that's been worn by someone. But um, having um, either feathers or flowers where you have a link straight with nature without being contaminated um, gives a direct link um, and a great source. So it's a, a rarity really come ac across these days. And so um, this Dreaming the New Dream is about having someone like yourself on the show and explaining to people that making that awesome connection with a piece of brown paper bag or whatever it is and you just put your hand in there and pick up a flower and it's got the res residue of a person who's put their love and thought and you get a link and um, you pass on yep. a message. And it is, mate. And as as you would both understand and know, everything grown by grown by nature has a diva essence energy attached to it and as in d-e-v-a the diva essence energy and it's that beautiful energy that i connect with at a spiritual level and it's got to the point now because i mean i've been reading flowers now for gee 37 years thereabouts i can't have lost track of time 37 38 years not that it matters but well that's when i started on the journey um but this has actually been my full-time profession now for the last 12 years so for the last 12 years of my life all I've done is pull flowers out of paper bags for people all over Australia. And true to Denise's prediction, I've done many thousands of readings uh, in that time and all over this wonderful country. And um, luckily, I can land in almost any city of any state and pick up the phone and ring somebody that I know and uh, catch up with them. It's just, it's a blessing. It's very, very humble work. It's very beautiful work. But uh, the point that I'm making here is that in those early days, as exactly like Denise would say, I'd have to pull the flower out of the bag and look at it, focus on it, hold it up to my third eye and I might get one or two words out or one or two visions out or something or other. It was very smattering. I mean, like every, most people in this work, guys, um, you don't just, you don't become this wafting huge big channel from a, from a child necessarily. So for me, the point that I'm making is that in the early days I was very, tottery and very you know jagged and everything else but today because i i virtually practice this every single day and i do like many shows almost every single night of, of the week um it's got to the point now as soon as i pick up a paper bag boom um the messages that it, well you've seen me work jeff it just flows out so quickly uh and all the images come it's like watching a movie screen so uh i would estimate that people probably get I mean, I did a, a show up at Pimpama last night. I had uh, nine ladies up there at a, one of those beautiful home shows that I do, and uh, um, I hadn't met any of these ladies before in my life. And I would estimate that they probably got 80 to 90% of their reading before I even opened up the bag and saw the flower. It's because as soon as I touch the bag, boom, it's gone. It's off. So because the energy is just connecting so quickly now. So it's not people say, oh, you know, I can't bring a yellow rose because that's my favourite colour and my favourite flower. But I couldn't find one. So all I could find was this. I said, darling, you can go and pick a leaf off a gum tree, pop it in the bag. It doesn't matter as long as it carries your energy. That's what I'm connecting to and, and the energy of the item. I mean, sometimes the items they choose, they might have a little bit of a bearing on the message, but essentially it's the energy of the person I'm connecting to. That's how it works. Cool. Jules? Yeah, David, that's, that's, that's a great story. So you were 23 when you when Denise put you on that path. What were you doing at the time? And, um, and oh, what did your parents say when you told them they were going to go full time on flowers? Oh, crazy, honey, crazy. Good questions. To answer your first question, I was working for uh, the retail store of uh, the, the chain of David Jones in Sydney. So uh, I'd, uh, we hadn't long moved up from the country in New South Wales. My family moved up from country New South Wales to uh, Campbelltown in southwestern Sydney. Uh, that was in 1980 and I just turned 20. And, um, and that was, I started, was starting to fiddle around as in doing a few little hand readings and getting books. I was gifted a book by a friend of mine at David Jones. That book became my Bible and it was called Reaching for the Other Side. And the authors were Dawn and Roland Hill. And they were both from Sydney. Have you heard of them, Jeff? Yeah, they actually end up in Tasmania, and they yes, came they back did. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what's happened to them? No, they did uh, break up, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I, did, I thought they had broken up, but gee, I'd love to have caught up with them, or at least you know, one of them, because they were so instrumental in assisting yeah. me on my path. Uh, because Sorry. everything in that book seemed to me, oh, my God, this was me, because we didn't have access to things like internet or anything back then, and everything, all the information in the world was via a book. 
and that's all there was to it, you know. Or if you were lucky enough to meet somebody like Denise, who was a teacher, so um, and that's how it was. But um, to answer your question, Jules, um, I work for David Jones, and you'll love this, honey. <laughs> you'll love this. I started practicing in the morning tea room of the staff room of David Jones. Well, my God, didn't I become a hit with all the uh, all the women from the cosmetics counter? All the all this perfume steamrollers used to say, "Get David to read your hands at morning tea." Oh my God, he's amazing! So I had all these gorgeous perfume steamrollers coming up, saying, "Can we have morning tea with you tomorrow?" I said, "Yes, okay, be, come and see me at ten o'clock." <laughs> And uh, I started to do, the, do these little hand readings, and that's how it started. And back then, mum and dad, mum and dad, oh, my God, I think I must have been about 15 or 16 uh, at the time, and mum got a bit scared because I was fiddling around with all these books and practising all these things. And at one stage I got some set of cards to try and understand cards. And all these predictions that I was making to m my parents' friends some of some a lot of these things started to come true and come to pass. I used to have a predilection for predicting pregnancies with pinpoint accuracy. Uh, pardon me, with uh, dates and times and sexes and colours and everything else. Anyway, Mum sat me down when I was about fifteen or sixteen, I guess, and she she sat me down with a cup of tea and ice bobo one day. She sat me down and she said, "Ice bobo, guys, is a biscuit. It's a, a cookie for those of you that are overseas. It's an Australian biscuit." She sat me down with an ice bobo and a cup of tea. And she said. Love, she said, this is scaring me. She said, what are you doing? She said, "Things. Are, how do you know these things? Oh, she said, you know, my friend came and told me that everything you told her has come to pass and it's all happened. Like, who are you talking to? Who are these people? I said, I don't know, Mum. I don't know. It's just, I just know. I, it's, I just connect to this knowing. It's knowledge. I can't understand. It's not a person. It's not a particular person. But all this information just comes into my head. And she said, well, I think you should put it down for a while because it's really scaring me. So I'll put it aside for a little while and then we moved to Sydney, like I said, and went kicked in with a vengeance when I hit my early 20s. And it got to the point, um, maybe not long after I met Denise, mum and dad, that must have been another eight or nine years after that. And I was fiddling around with all this beautiful, um, all the trialling, all these different techniques and modalities. And I told mum and dad that I'd met Denise and it started to pique their interest a little. And uh, I remember one day mum said, love, she said, you know what you should do? And I said, what, that's, what's that? She said, I reckon you should get your parents to have a little group of people together. Get Tell them to put a group of people together, love, and start practising. <laughs> so, okay. So I started practising. Now, I must tell you something. You, you, This is fascinating. It was not long after I met Denise. I was sitting in her kitchen one day. And she was there puffing away on a windfield blue on her cigarette, having a coffee, and she's staring at me while she's chatting to me. And I said, what's wrong? And she's looking me up and down like this. She said, love, I've got to ask you something. And I said, what? She said, this is so going to make you laugh. She said, your head's all buggered. <laughs> I said, what? She said, I'm looking at your head and it's all buggered. What have you done to your head? I said, I've done nothing to my head. She said, well, love, it's buggered. You've done something. And I said, what do you mean buggered? She said, I'm looking at your energy. It's all broken around the top. You've smashed your head. What have you done? And I went, aha. I said, you might be right. She said, what? I said, actually, you might be right. I said, when I was six years of age, I actually had a major accident. She said, what happened? I said, mum and dad had built a relatively new house and had a high veranda, but they hadn't got to putting the railing up. And I actually ba overbalanced and I fell off the balcony, landed headfirst on the footpath down below, smashed my head open. I had 27 stitches down the top of my head. The doctors could not believe that I didn't fracture my skull, but I didn't. And the funny thing is it is the earliest memory I have of my life. I can remember laying there, felt no pain, but I remember, I can, I remember feeling very wet. And my grandfather, my late grandfather, was the first one down the stairs. He was visiting. He had a pipe and he had to pull the pipe out of his mouth. I'm laying there. Mum's screaming. And he popped it and touched me. And he just pulled the pipe out and mum screamed. And he said, don't worry, Margaret. He'll be all right. He'll be all right. Don't worry. And that was it. That's the memory. Now, do you know what Denise said that day? She said, love, that day you hit your head, she said, that's opened up your crown chakra. It smashed your crown chakra open. She said, it's given you a, a direct connection to the universe. I've since read in various biographies over the years of different other, you know, psychics, mediums, clairvoyants, and it's amazing how many people have actually suffered head trauma and it opened their gift up. Do you guys remember a fellow by the name of Tom Ward? No. Tom, well, actually, Tom Wards. I think it was Ward or Wards. 
Tom Wards was a quite a famous psychic here in Australia, and uh, he was on the morning show. He had columns in the paper. He was very high profile. He was based in Sydney. Uh, he's long since passed now, but he was the biggest disbeliever of all this work until one day he was playing a game of cricket and he got hit in the in the uh, head with a cricket ball. He was knocked unconscious and he was concussed and he was he was quite you know badly injured. Took him off to hospital, but when he recovered, he fully recovered. But it smashed open his third eye, and he became a famous psychic clairvoyant medium. Amazing. And he said he could not believe what had happened. So a very sim similar thing had happened to him. Hmm. I got a mate in England there. He fell off a fire truck. Really? Yeah, and then he opened up and became a well-known um, healer and medium and did shows all around the UK. He used to come out to right. Australia. Yeah. Yep. That's, and, Jeff, you know what? It's such a common story. And, I mean, that's, that is my story. Look. I mean, I've got no proof of this. I mean, I, I can't explain why I've got this skill, gift or talent. But, I mean, obviously, maybe Denise was right. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe it, I don't know. I mean, I haven't had all my charts and things done to see, you know, whether I'm, you know, naturally gifted that way or whether it was just something that was the of the, the trauma of going through that that's opened it up. I mean, obviously, I'm a very, very sensitive soul anyway. I'm very sensitive by nature and uh, that's my demeanour and uh, I've always been wanting to work with people and help people and uh, guide people on their path and journey in their life. And uh, I'm doing a lot of mentoring sessions now with like private one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions for quite a few people and just enjoying it so much. And I, that's what I've been doing all my life. I just love it. So I um, just want to bring people's awareness to the fact that you do these, um, what your mum and mum are saying, look, we just get the, us parents together and we get a few friends around and you can do the, these little sessions. Now, you've actually taken that to the next level because that's exactly what you do. You do these little parties, don't you? Mm -hmm, I do. It's really funny because, you know, life is always setting us up, Jeff, for our future. Like, there's a plan there's a plan and there's a there's a there's a whole purpose in everything that we do now i mean like most people unless you know you are somebody who knows without a shadow of a doubt that this is what you want to do or be for the rest of your life i mean a lot of people don't really find their way through life until mid or late later on life and some people don't really align with their dharma which is you know, your life mission and purpose and i didn't even understand what the word dharma was until uh, I really got into this work and started started to study spiritual law. And anyway, because I mean, I had great jobs, I had great businesses, I had a career in the media that lasted for uh, uh, almost 12 years and I was in the print and media industry in Sydney. I ran, what, four suburban newspapers over uh, almost a decade in Sydney. So, um, you know, I'm from a corporate type of background and uh, done all that, uh, I've done all that sort of work and I loved it. I mean, I'm an advertising person by trade, writing ads and jingles and things. I love all that sort of stuff. I'm a bit of a wordsmith, as you well know. I love uh, I love writing. So, uh, and that's my thing. And I thought, oh, well, this is what I'll do. I'll get into my media industry, into the media career and off I'll go. And I had a fabulous stellar career in the industry. But after that, um, I finished at the age of 40. I left that and started into my own business, distributing alternative medicines and going down the healing path with um, working with a, a lot of scientists, biochemists and and, uh, those sorts of people and that's when I started to really explore my spiritual side and that's when I became very much aware that there is the mind body soul uh, we talk about people needing to be um, physically fit we talk about people getting a, a, a um, go to the gym saying so you build yourself a six-pack well often often I'll, I'll often ask people how strong is your spiritual six-pack what are you doing to build your spiritual um, uh, health and uh, and keeping that in check and keeping that in in uh, in alignment because that's that's you know equally if not more important than it is on the physical side of things because it all it's all in harmony anyway long story short um, at the end at the age of 46 uh, my marriage ended, and after 20 years of marriage, I actually, uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but uh, I, I actually came out as a gay guy after 20 years of marriage. Uh, couldn't do the battle anymore. Thank God my ex-wife and I are still very, very close friends, and we were able to separate very amicably, and we have a beautiful daughter who's now 26 and very happily married with uh, a grandchild and another one on the way and uh, we are still very 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 close we, we couldn't possibly be closer but the girls live in sydney they've all got their own lives i'm here on the gold coast here in australia and i've got my own life but the, the reason i'm telling you that at the age of 48 49 uh, about two years after i got divorced 
Um, my life just crashed and crumbled and I lost everything. I got caught up in the GFC. I was heavily invested in some um, uh, investments that just went belly up. So essentially I lost everything and I we worked very hard and, you know, we'd accumulated some nice things and had a, had a great future ahead of us. But you know what, in this, with the stroke of a pen, it was all gone. So at the age of 49, I had $49 left in my wallet and I had nothing. I had no dream. My business had gone. I was pretty much unemployable because I'd been working for myself for nine years at that point and I didn't ever, ever, ever want to work you know, for a boss again, but I just thought, what the hell am I going to do now? And I was destitute, I was broke, um, and I was I was on the verge of being kicked out on the street. And um, anyway, uh, my car had been repossessed. I had no transport, had no money, had no job, no business. I flatly refused to go and get help from the government because that's that's the way I am. I don't rely on anyone, a little bit on the, the, the proud side of things. And I just couldn't get I couldn't believe that I'd got into this point of like, where, how the hell did I get here? But anyway, I did. But long story short, the point that I'm making is that um, a dear friend of mine, very, very dear friend of mine, took me in. She was just horrified at what had happened to me. She said, for God's sake, come and stay with me and I'll uh, just bunk in here with me until you get back on your feet. And I said, honey, I can't even afford to pay your rent. She said, I don't care. Just come and stay with me. I'm not going to have you on the street. All I had was a few clothes on my back and the 49 bucks in my wallet. Long story short, we were sitting there one day and we we're talking about our spirit, my spiritual path and journey. And I told her how I had, you know, was doing all these flower readings along the course of the way. And thankfully, she was very spiritually aware and spiritually minded. And she said, you know what? I've got an idea. And I said, what's that? She said, why don't I get a couple of friends together? And uh, you should come over and uh, and I'll get them to come over and you should read their flowers. And I said, oh, God, honey, I said, I don't think so. She said, why not? I said, I think that gift was repossessed as well. The bank <laughs> I'm, I'm damn sure that I can't even do it. She said, don't be ridiculous. She said, look, just let me get a few people together. So anyway, she got these people together, these lovely ladies. And, oh, my God, I felt humiliated, embarrassed. And they came in all excited. And I'm thinking, holy God, I hope there's some mother of blessed messages. Don't fail me now. And I jokingly said to them, I said, ladies, I haven't done this for a couple of years. I don't even know if I've got a gift anymore. I think it's gone. And I said, if it, I said, here's the deal. If, if I don't get any messages, we'll turn it into a Tupperware party. And that's the best we can do. And they had a laugh and a giggle. So anyway, they sat down. Oh, well, my God. Oh, my God. I'll never forget. Um, I'm sitting there nervous as buggery. And the very last lady arrived and all the flowers were left at the front door because I didn't want to see their bags. And this lady walked in at the front door. And Diane said, oh, you know, uh, hi, Denise, how are you going? I'll call her Denise, I don't know what her name is. And she said, put your bag there. And as soon as the lady put the bag down, I said, excuse me, love. And she looked at me. I said, um, are you a chef? And she said, no. I said, you must be a chef. She said, no, I'm not a chef. I said, I can smell food off your bag from here. And I've got beautiful food. I can already see beautiful plates of food laid out. And she looked at me. And she said, no, um, no, I'm a school teacher. I said, why do I get this food? And it's beautiful food. It's like all this, and it's all, it looks like a restaurant. Oh, my God. She went, oh, my God, just like that. I said, what is it? What is it? What is it? She said, oh, my God, that's crazy. I said, does it make any sense? She said, yes. She said, I was in such a flap to get here tonight, raced to get here. She said, I got home from work and had a shower, got dressed. She said, I raced. Uh, down to a, a local restaurant to have dinner before I came to Dyes. I'm sitting there in the restaurant and I realised I'd forgotten to pick a flower to bring. She went, oh, my God, I forgot to pick a flower. So she said, I went into the chef and said, can I borrow a flower out of your garden? So the chef picked her a flower out of his garden, put it into a paper bag and gave it to her. That's what it was. That's what it was. Um. So I, and I thought, and she went, oh, my God. And everyone went, oh, my God. And my friend Diana went, geez, Dave. And I thought, we're back in business, baby. <laughs> now, do you know what? I did that reading that night. Now, that was in 2009, I think it was. I did that reading or that group in 2009, and I have not stopped working since that night. Well, that, that, that because three ladies at the end... Uh, three ladies at the end said, hey, have you got a business card? Can we book you for some friends? I said, oh, geez, I don't have any business cards. I'm only doing this for Diana. They said, well, look, we just love this. This is so much fun. Could you come to our place? I said, oh, okay. And Diana went, here's your chance. And um, that's how it all started for me to where I am today. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I wasn't working every single night 
after that. I mean, God, I bumped and kicked and scraped. It wasn't an over. I always say to people, it took me eight years to become an overnight success. But as a result of that night, it was only maybe three months after that, I was having my little chat to the universe and thanking them profusely for, um, you know, bringing this opportunity into my life. And I said, I'm open for all the opportunities. So in, in essence, the big, the big step for me after that, I received a phone call from the program director of the Golden Door Health Retreat here on the Gold Coast, which sadly has now closed down. But gosh, that was a very famous health retreat. It'd been going for 30 odd years. And uh, Andrea Baker was the program director up there and she rang and introduced herself to me and she said, are you the flower man? I said, yes, honey, I am, but I'm not a florist. And she laughed and she said, no, I know that. She said, I've had a number of my staff and a couple of my guests have actually mentioned your name. And she said, I have a lot of people approaching me asking if they can come up and work here and I don't let anyone in at all. I said, well, why are you ringing me? And she said, well, you're different. I said, why is that? She said, well, you connect with nature. And she said, we have a we have a, a health retreat that's in a rainforest and I think it would be a nice match. So she said, have you got any time to see me? I said, honey, any time in the next three minutes, it'd be great because I'm desperate for work. So anyway, she said, come up tomorrow and we'll have a chat. So long story short, I went up there the next day. Um, I got her to get some of her staff together, did a little flower reading in a group so that she could I could demonstrate what I did and as well as individual readings. And she said, there's your contract. When can you start? I said, tomorrow. She said, great. And I worked there for two years. And then as a result of that, I then went on to work for The Biggest Loser, the behind the scenes of The Biggest Loser, and worked uh, with a number of the people that went on to the show there, uh, doing um, spiritual guidance and readings for them um, for another six months after that. And then I left to pursue my own, um, my own path in this work. And that was about eight years ago. That's amazing. So the biggest loser, they actually paid you to give spiritual guidance to their people mm -hmm. so that they, they could get fit. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So I, I was an option for them because, you know, as you would understand, Julia, most people think that, you know, the biggest loser is just about all the, uh, the, the, the diet and the exercise, which, of course, it is, but it's also about this. It's about the mindset, you know, because, I mean, I mean, the stories I heard from some of the people went on the show, it's like they, they really, really needed to do some work. And I mean, they had professional counsellors and guidance people there to help them because it's not just all about losing weight. I mean, a lot of them lost so much weight, but if they weren't careful, they could, they could at the end of the show, put it all back on if they didn't have the mindset to, to go with that. Do you know what I mean? It's a very common oh, thing. Absolutely. And um, mm. yeah, because I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of people and often it's actually the empaths, the really sensitive people who've had dreadful experiences and they just put that weight on as protection so mm -hmm. they don't have to feel so much. Correct. That's so, right. Yeah, I can understand you working with them to, you know, behind the scenes would would um, give them the was, safety that they could. It was, honey. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And it was a privilege for me to work with these people because, I mean, a couple of times I said to them, hey, how much do I owe you? I wanted to pay you because they were so inspiring and I got so inspired by them, but they got inspired by some of the stuff that I shared with them and some of the techniques that uh, I shared with them. So it was um, it was a win-win situation, but uh, very, uh, very gratifying work, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, I often say to people, I've been in this work for 12 years now and I have not worked in 12 years. <laughs> I haven't worked in 12 years. <laughs> this has not worked to me. This is not work. I'm just, I'm in, I'm playing in a sandpit of just great people and great experiences. I bring joy, laughter, validation into people's lives through this lovely skill that I've got. And um, people, it's a en very entertaining night. It's very uplifting. It's very, um, very on point. It's very, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people just get, get the wow factor out of it. I still get the wow factor out of it. I mean, there's not a night that goes by when I don't get in the car to drive home and I just give my thanks to spirit all the way home. I'm very much into gratitude and I've said thank you, thank you, thank you for the lovely messages and thank you for the accuracy of uh, all the stuff that comes through. So it's just beautiful. Hey, um, what I liked was um, the Monday mornings at the Golden Door Retreat when all the practitioners um, and all different modalities would have to get up and look, give a little five-minute, seven-minute tutorial oh. but TV about who you were, what you had to do at the Golden Door. And so... Oh, did you, you do that? Hey? 
Did you go there? Were you a part no, of it? I remember you telling them about 10 years ago you told the story. And I was like, oh, oh what? I, I couldn't remember what I've told you, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was all those years ago. So I, I locked it and I thought, you're getting all these people from all walks of life, from professional oh. uh, hard dudes and all that stuff. And then, you know, towards Thursday, Friday, between, you know, they've got a seven day thing and you might see this businessman meekly turn up and say, difference, the difference in them. Um, for example, there was. Uh, one particular fellow who uh, was uh, was very um, famous in the business world here in Australia. I certainly won't mention his name, but he came to see me and he had lost his position in life. And back then he was in his uh, mid-50s, I guess, and he came in uh, just in runners and shorts and T-shirt because that was the attire for everyone. There was no names, no pack drill, and he came in and sat down and he had lost his identity, he had lost his way, and he was convinced that what had happened to him was the worst, worst thing. And he just said, uh, but because he was attached to the the um, the identity of his character, of the CEO of this massive company, that's that's who he was. And suddenly, when that was taken from him, it's like, well, who? The hell am I now? What am I? I said, mate, what you don't, I'll call him Bill. You know what, Bill? I said, you don't realise, mate, but this is a blessing for you. He said, how could you call it a blessing? And that's when I was able to cite the example of what had happened to me at the age of 49. And I said, now I know why I went through what I went through because it gives me licence to look you in the eye and say, you know what? You're going to be okay. You have to look at this as a gift because <laughs> the most, bless you, sweetheart, the most, the most important thing to remember is this. You think you've lost your job and you, you lost this and you've, yes, you have. But then what's the most important thing you haven't lost? And he couldn't actually name it. I said, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's what the reason that you're here on this retreat, you have not lost your health. And if you've got your health, you can rebuild your life no matter how old you are, no matter what's going on in your life. Because if you don't value your health, the moment that it's gone and you can't retrieve it with all the money in the world, what would, what's the point of all this? What's the point of the whole thing? Anyway, he was he was really quite you know struck by it all, and um, it was um, quite amazing to see the difference in him over that whole week. And uh, and there was I'll, I'll, I will tell you this too. Um, there was another gentleman who came along, and he came in. God, it was funny. He came in, and he I had I had the, you have to imagine this, guys. I had a tiny little cabin up a footpath in the middle of a rainforest massive big trees and it was a little cabin and I had all the candles lit inside the trees were scraping on the metal roof it was a tin roof and when it rained it was amazing because I heard the rain on the tin roof and I had this and you had to walk up with an umbrella up this footpath all through these trees to get to my little cottage that was hidden away and I had lounges in there and I had all my candles on and all my light, nice quiet music it was just so idyllic and this one gentleman came up and he was um, I've still got all his details there, his name and contact number. He was one of Melbourne's top lawyers and he was the he was a third partner in one of Melbourne's leading law firms. And as soon as he walked in, I thought, I know you. And when he told me who he, who he was, I said, oh, okay. Anyway, you know what he said to me? This is so funny. He said, look, he came in with his little bag with the flower in it. And this guy is, he's a big power puncher in the legal world in Melbourne. He came in and he said, now, listen here. I said, what? He said, I'm not telling you nothing. <laughs> I said, oh, what gives you, what what, what reason do you think you'll even have to speak? He said, oh, people like you ask a lot of questions. I said, well, Buster, you sit down there, close your eyes and listen because you will not have a chance to speak until I'm finished. <laughs> oh, all right then, all right. So he <laughs> sat down and took his flower and I went into this whole big thing. Anyway, long story short, halfway through the channeling, I could hear the tissues being pulled out of the box. I could hear sniffling. I thought he must have a cold or the flu. He was crying. And I thought, oh, my God, because when I stopped, he had tears rolling down his cheek. I said, oh, are you okay? And he just went like this. He just went, he said, okay, 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 okay. He said, okay. He said, you couldn't even find out what you just told me. He said, you couldn't even find that out if you did some digging around to try and find it. I said, "How? why would I even try and dig around to find out about you? I didn't even know you were coming to see me today. I just saw your name on, a, on, on the schedule and you walked in. I said, I don't know who you are. He said, oh, my God. Anyway, long story short, this is why I'm telling you the story. He, we just connected. He said, can I tell you something? I said, what? He said, I have... Uh, very strong connections to the Melbourne underworld. I said, do you now? He said, yes, I do. And he said, would you be open 
to come down to Melbourne to chat to some people that I know. He said they could learn a lot from people like you. And he said they need to know the errors of their ways. I said, well, they don't need to know the errors of their ways through me. I'm happy to meet you anyway. And he said, he said they'll, they'll, they're, they're great guys. He said, they'll treat you. You don't have to worry. He said, they're, I'm a, he said, I represent them. And I said, okay, that's cool. And I've since seen him on quite a number of um, news reports of when there's been big things in Melbourne. I thought, oh, my God, there he is. Um, he's standing at the front of the court with all the media around him. So I thought, oh, my God, there he is. And he just said, would you be prepared to come down? I said, yeah. He said, oh, he said, my wife and I live in Turak. And he said, we've got a favourite little pub at the end of the street. He said, I want you to meet uh, my wife. I want three of us to have dinner. And he said, oh, we just want to pick your brain. He said, she will love you and you will love her. Little, little, little. And he said, I'll put you up in the best hotel. I'll get you picked up at the uh, at the airport. And this is so going to make you laugh, guys. He said to me, uh, he said, um, do, you, uh, do you mind if I ask you a very personal question? I said, what's that? He said, are you married or are you single? I said, no, I'm single. He said, oh, okay. And he looked away with a grin and he said, because if you're prepared to come down for the weekend, I said, um, I can arrange to have you picked up and I can arrange um, for someone to uh, meet up with you. Very nice to spend the weekend with. I said, oh, really? You could? He said, yes, I could. He said, I can, I can arrange, a, you know, someone very, very special. I said, well, can I ask you a favour? And he said, anything, anything. I said, can you just make sure he's got a hairy chest and a deep voice? He went, oh, Jesus. Oh, really? Oh, okay. 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 Oh, he said, okay, that's thrown me. He said, but don't leave it with me. Leave it with me. I'll arrange it. <laughs> so oh, anyway, God. that's it. So, oh, my God. Guys, the stories I can tell you of the people I've met, uh, this, oh, my God, there's, uh, there's 12 years, well, more than 12 years worth of stories, just uh, lots, but uh, many, many validations. But please, if you've got any questions, I'm doing all the talking, but just fire away. Hey, um, what I like was um, how things to snowball. I mean, you just told us about the lawyer, but um, there was a time when you went to Sydney and um, it related to Qantas doing the massive layoffs and, and people were given a, a time frame when they'd be laid off. And you went down and you did this reading for this lady who went for Qantas and then it just went gangbusters, didn't it? It did, yes. Um um, this beautiful lady's name is Karen. She's still a friend of mine to this day. And she worked in ground crew. And um, they were going through some big layoffs and big uh, big challenges down there. And anyway, uh, Karen organised me um, to go down there. there was, I mean, she was just the one person, but my Lord, um, it just it, it did, Jeff, it snowball. That was a few years ago. Gee, you got a good memory. I'd forgotten all about that because I've just, I've just got so many experiences since that time, I think. There's so many. So until somebody says, "Hey, remember the time blah blah blah," I think, "Oh my God, that's 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 true." Like almost like the golden the golden door story when you mentioned that I got up to speak. But I went down to uh, Sydney and I ended up spending probably, oh my gosh, probably the better part of mm, three to six months down there working with a lot, a lot of people and uh, yeah, giving them uh, lots of um, guidances, readings, validations, and things. So yeah, it was uh, really quite amazing. Yeah, so it's um, it's at the point now, I guess, where you know I have I don't have any doubt about, and neither should our our beautiful listeners. For those of you that are listening or watching, um, please don't doubt what is in store for you or what the possibilities can be. I often say to people, be prepared to say yes to an opportunity when it arises. Because you have no idea what that opportunity can mean for you and where it can lead you. And that is leading into another quick story that I have to tell you because this is mind blowing uh, what happened to me. Now, this dates back or goes back to 2011, about, oh no, not quite, 2012. 2012 it was. One day I was just going down to Woolworths to get a, a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk for lunch. I thought I'll go down to Woolies and get a, down to a local shopping centre. I went down to Woolies and got into the shopping centre. As I walked into the shopping centre, opposite Woolworths was a travel agent and in the window was a huge big picture of a cruise ship. And I looked at it and I thought, I want to go on that. So I just walked in, totally spontaneous, walked in, sat down 
And the lady said, can I help you? I said, that cruise ship in the window. She said, yeah. I said, I want to go on that. <laughs> she said, oh, okay, good. When do you want to go on it? I said, um, what have you got around August? This was in May. She said, and I said, around about August. And I want to go for about 10 days around the South Pacific. So she gets on there. Brrr. She said, yep, there's there's one that goes on the 6th of August. I said, good, book me on that, please, 10 nights. She said, okay, name, address, phone number. Typed it all up. And I said, how much is the deposit? She said, it's $200. I opened up my wallet. I had four $50 notes, $200 exactly. I said, look at that. I must be meant to go. She said, that's cool. I gave her the money and she typed it all up. She said, Mr. Laws, do you even know where you're going? I said, no, I don't care. I said, I just need to be on that ship. I just have to get on that ship. She said, well, that you have got to be the easiest client I've ever had in my life. I said, to be honest, honey, I've done a couple of cruises around the South Pacific. I'm not going for the islands. I'm going for for the getaway and for the trip. Oh, that's fantastic. So then I went and got the loaf of bread and the bottle of milk, got in the car, and I rang a girlfriend of mine in Brisbane, and I said, Di, guess what I've done? And I told her what I've done. She said, oh, God, you're bloody crazy. I said, I am crazy. I said, but you know what's even crazier? She said, what? I said, you're coming with me. She said, oh, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. Here's the travel agent's number. Ring her. Tell her that you're going to book a trip with me. I said, get out. Come on. You've got to get out and have a holiday. Oh, she said, I couldn't do such a, a crazy thing. I said, do it. I dare you. 15 minutes later, she rings me, nearly crying down the phone. She said, I've just booked. I'm coming with you. I said, are you kidding? She said, I am. And I'm on the same deck as you. I said, oh my God, we're going to have a ball. She broke down and cried. She said, David, I'm 57. I've never had a passport in my life. I've never traveled outside of Queensland. I've never, I've just been a mum and a housewife and this is all that's left for me. And I said, well, you're about to see the world. Come on, let's go. And I said, have you told your husband? Her <laughs> husband's name, Bob. And she said, um, yeah, she said, oh, my God. She said he was sitting there reading the paper. She said, Bob, Bob. He said, what, love, what? She said, I've just booked a cruise with Dave. And he shook the paper. He said, oh, good on you, love. I'll drop you at the wharf. <laughs> anyway, I so I put a story on Facebook and said, I've just done, you've got to do spontaneous, crazy things sometimes. Anyway, little did I know what was in store. My God. I put a story on Facebook and said, I'm doing this crazy thing. Look what I did. Guys, you've got to be spontaneous. Eight people contacted me and said, oh, my God, can we come with you? I said, of course you can. So in the end, there was 10 of us sailed out of Sydney Harbour one afternoon. We did the sail away cruise down the harbour. We're all drinking mojitos. We're doing the cha-cha around the boat deck. All the music's going on. We had an absolute ball. And as we cruised out the heads, um, everyone said, my God, this started because you went down the street for a, a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk. I said, that's right. And I said, so when I... When I go shopping for dinner next year, God knows where we'll end up. So anyway, <laughs> we did the 10-night cruise, but guess what happened? I'm still getting to the point, but this is where it is. On the very last night of the cruise, we'd all had dinner together and we um, went down uh, to the bar to have farewell drinks. I said, let's all meet at the bar at 8.30. Yep, cool. So we all met there at the uh, we all met at the bar at 8.30, but just before everyone arrived, I got there first. The bar was packed. I got a glass of red wine. And I'm walking through this packed bar and there was one empty chair uh, in this group. And there was a guy sitting there with his arm around his girlfriend and she was chatting to all these people. And he looked at me and he said, hey, bloke. And I looked at him. I said, yeah. He said, hey, bloke, would you like a chair? I said, yeah, I will, bloke. I will. I'll come and sit down. He said, come and sit here. So I sat down beside him. He said, how you going, bloke? I said, bloke, I'm bloody good, thanks. I am fantastic. He said, you had a good cruise? Had a ball. I said, so where are you from? He said, we're from Tasmania. I said, oh, fantastic. I said, well, my name's David. He said, my name's Scott. This is my partner, Kerry. Ah, chatted away. And as I always do, I started to instigate a conversation. So what do you do? He said, I'm a potato farmer. And he said, I grow all the potatoes for McDonald's and supply McDonald's with all their fries and hash browns. And that we talked about potato farming and vegetable farming for about 10 minutes. And he said, anyway, what about you, bloke? What do you do? I said, oh, mate, this is going to snap your cap. And he said, what's that? I said, I'm a professional psychic. He said, are you serious? And I said, yep. Yeah. He said, Kerry, ask David what he does. So, of course, she came in on the conversation. He said, David, you can't believe how much we are into all this work. We love, we want to know more about situations like people like you and, and you know, your, your life situation. Do you know, guys, we sat there. We got there at 8. I got there at 8.30. We were still sitting in the bar at quarter to three in the morning. Everyone had gone gone back to their cabins, getting ready to do the sail in at 5.30 in the city heads. Scott Kerry and I are still sitting there. They said, right, have you ever been to Tasmania? I said, never in my life. They said, you are coming to Tassie. We're going to line people up for you, and you're going to come down and have a holiday with us. 
I said, oh, my God, that would be fantastic. Now, guys, these two people, Scott and Kerry, today are two of my dearest, dearest friends. Within six months of that cruise, I flew to Tasmania. I'd never been there in my life. Today, I know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in Tasmania because they had one flower reading party for me and it just spread. They cannot believe how many people I know down there. And I said, that's because of you guys. Yeah. That's where it, you take it, the opportunity, isn't it? And the opportunity is given. Take the you. opportunity and it's like it's all predestined in that sense. It's like, oh, my God, it's a sliding doors moment. If I didn't take that opportunity to, to say, oh, thanks, mate, no, I'll be right, I'll just stand here waiting for friends, I thought I'll sit down and have a chat to this guy and look where it led. Yeah. Mm. Right, yeah. Well, you make it sound pretty easy, but I'm sure in terms of coming back to what you referred to about the spiritual fitness and the training, keeping your six-pack, what – what is it that you did to, you know, keep yourself fit? And Spiritual. From two words from the flowers to <laughs> okay. a great download. Books. Okay. <clears throat> lots of books, lots of reading, lots of research and lots lots of practice. There we go. Um, that's a, that's one of my Bible. I mean, that's a beautiful one. I'm, many of you would know of uh, the beautiful late uh, Michael Rowland. And uh, this is my Bible. This is the book that saved me from the pits of hell. And uh, I don't know whether people are aware of this. If you are listening, I'll, I'll spell it out for you. It's The Wisdom of Florence Scovel Shin, S-H-I-N-N. You can uh, Google it and you can go into you, it. You, it's easy to purchase. But it's a collection of uh, four books there. But this lady died in 1944, wrote this book in the, the early uh, 1900s. The wisdom in this book is phenomenal. And um, that's where this was the, that put me on the comeback trail from the pits of hell and horror. And um, I teach so much of my stuff today. A lot of my workshops, I glean information from this book. Uh, Michael's book, I mean, so, so many books that I uh, immerse myself in. And, uh, and also, it's just practicing um, meditation. Meditation is a, is a big part of my life, which I enjoy. Um, and the, the, I think particularly now, guys, the, the, the very important thing, we all know what's happening in the world at the moment, and it's very easy to get caught up in the current of all the negativity and all the horrors and all the worries and stresses of all, you know, all the things that are happening in the world. So I often say to people there are many things that uh, we can do to negate um, the, what's happening in the world, to uh, the, the negate it from us. And I often make reference to the fact that there are two worlds that exist. I'm not talking about spirit world. I talk about the world and I talk about my world. And the only way that I can cope in the world is for me to create my world. So I have diligently and carefully created and cultivated a wonderful life. And I'm very careful about what and who I allow into my life. Television is not a part of my life. Mainstream media is not a part of my life, has not been for some time. Um, I'm a, an avid reader. I'm a writer. I, I love my music and I'm very careful about... Uh, who I mix with, the type of people I uh, immerse myself with. So I've got beautiful, uh, just a nice, you know, I mean, as you can appreciate, I know a great, great many people, but I've still just got my beautiful little core uh, group of close friends who are like-minded souls. And, um, and I look at uplifting people and I look at people who uplift me and uplifting each other as much as we can. Now, that's not to say you don't have a bad day or a, you know, a shitty day from time to time. Of course you do. We're all human. You can't just be up there all the time. But I always make reference to the fact we have to pay attention to our vibration because our vibration is where it's, that's the engine room. That's where it all happens. So once we understand the, what what it is that we are immersing ourselves in, what we watch, what we listen to, what we take aboard, um, that's all affecting our vibration. And whatever affects your vibration affects what and who you're going to attract into your life, be it a person or an experience. And uh, the only reason that I've been able to um, pull myself back from the pits of hell is understanding spiritual law, practicing uh, some wonderful simple techniques that everyone can, um, can attune to, and you can, you can turn your life around. But I often say to people, once you discover what you are here to do, um, I was fortunate enough to align myself with what I was here to do. Now, even though I knew that I had this gift and talent and skill, I never realised, I didn't realise for years and years and years that that would be my mainstay. This would be the thing that would 
be the main part of my life and my journey. I had no idea. I knew I could. I knew I had the skill and the ability to do what I do, but I thought I could never make a living out of this. But oh boy, wasn't I? Uh, um, you know, pleasantly surprised about that one. So, but I had to realize that. So, in essence, guys, I had to lose everything to gain everything. So, it's out of the loss came the great gain. At a gain, it's a very common um, theme in people's lives. Some people lose everything a couple of times in life, and they bounce back. Um, so, it, it's a common theme, but it's all designed to uh, strengthen the the resolve of the human um, soul. Mm. That's good, Dave. Um, just changing the subject a bit. Uh, um, there was a guy called Don Lane, used to be on uh, Channel 9. Yeah, and, uh, remember him he, well. He used the to Lane be a, Yeah, that's the guy. He was very, um, a great advocate for Doris Stokes, and he always bring Doris on the show when she turned up. In the I show. remember that. I used to watch it. Yeah, so um, there's one guy who actually sort of got in just a open up a wedge there for, for people to see that there was a shimmer of light to sort of say that there are people out there who, who've got gifts and, and it, it's not not football, it's not cricket, it's um, it's not making money on the stock exchange. Everybody's got a gift. And um, yeah, Doris brought a gift there to sort of show that there was life after death, wasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. There is no death. There is no death. There's only death of the current situation. There's only death of the physical and the death of the body. The body, you know, is the, the like we call it the the vehicle, the overcoat that we wear to um, carry us through on this physical journey, this particular incarnation to learn all our lessons. And then um, it's cast aside when its job is done and we progress onwards. Uh, there's no, there's just no doubt about that. Now, I know it's very difficult for people. You know, there are many people who don't really understand or believe that there's an afterlife. That's fair enough as well. I mean, it's very difficult to explain that to somebody who doesn't know or understand or see what perhaps people like you and I can. It's almost like trying to describe to a blind person what a colour is, let alone the difference between blue, red and green. So um, it can be very difficult for people to grasp, you know, what, what it is, the concept of life after death. But um, proof of life, I mean, gosh, there's been so many examples of that I've had a proof of life. I wouldn't refer to myself necessarily as a medium. I can certainly do mediumship work, but I've had countless experiences of, uh, of um, delivering mediumship messages to people. And it's easy for me to, to say that it is real and that uh, the afterlife exists. There's got a million stories there that I can tell you about. But I think more than anything, it's just we're at a point now, the, the consciousness of humanity is changing, thank God. And it's it's growing, it's expanding. And I've even got people coming to see me now who um, have said to me, I wouldn't, five years ago, 10 years ago, David, I would not have been seen dead seeing somebody like you. You wouldn't have seen, you wouldn't have seen me for dust. But you know what? I've got questions now. And particularly men, a lot of men are starting to open up now, which is very nice to see. It's very reassuring to see the guys come along and go, okay, so what have you got on offer? And it's really nice because I'm very gentle with the, the way I introduce um, my work. Um, from time to time, I'll, I'll actually do it like a, I'll have an information night. I had two of them in Tasmania just recently. Oh, my God, they just booked out in, in minutes. It was crazy. We had packed rooms. And uh, I just spoke between, gosh, 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. It was a Q&A. And I just sat there and I, I put everyone at ease. And I said, guys, I want you to know I'm not here to try to convince you or coerce you or to do, even change your belief system. I am nothing more than a messenger. And I am a messenger of information, of experience, of teachings, of spiritual um, guidance that I receive from the higher source. And we are all conduits. And I'm here. My sole intention for you is to uh, help you live a better life, whatever that may be. If I can, if there's something I can do or say or be that will enhance your journey or your your life in some way, well, I've done God's work, and that's all I'm here to do. And the more the the, the, the more betterment I bring into your life, will bring betterment into my life, because the greatest way to serve our soul and our soul growth is to be of service to humanity, which is why we've all been gifted with these talents, skills, and abilities. Um, that other people um, are gifted in, in different areas. And I only had this conversation with one of my uh, students today. I said, because she said, oh, my God, but I'm not as good as this person doing this or that or that. I said, sweetheart, 
um, comparison is the thief of joy. You will never advance if you don't understand. Don't stop looking over the fence. Just focus on you and your gift and your talent, your skill and ability, and uh, immerse yourself in that, and you'll be you'll be thrilled to see where that can take you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of distraction in, in um, especially of our young ones. You know, there's just oh, there is Julia. Attention focus is so hard. It's very, very difficult, particularly for the young ones, because it's so easy for them to get caught up and immersed in all the trends of what's happening and and what's accepted, what's not not accepted. I mean, like well, we're all young once, and we all crave to be accepted and to be loved by our peers and to be admired by our peers. So there's an awful lot of pressure out there to um, conform in that way. And I mean, plus you've got all the things that are happening in the world today that um, that are also um, putting everyone under pressure, you know, ourselves. You know, it's just uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult time. And that's why I think more than ever it's important for people to learn to go within, to go within. Uh, and to um, to have that courage to take that journey within. I know the younger ones don't truly understand what that is, and that's uh, that, that is a bit of a challenge, particularly if their parents don't know what that's all about. So it's not an, it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But for people that are led to this work or to this vibration, something attracts them. There's no reason. Sorry, there's no coincidence, Julia, that you and I are meeting tonight. And that we're connecting. There's no coincidence, and Jeff and I have met some years ago. There's no coincidence that any of us meet each other, but it's all for a particular reason and a purpose. We may have the privilege of becoming great friends for a lifetime, or we may meet each other once or twice in life, and that's it, but it was still divinely perfect. But I believe that every person has a role to play in our lives in some way, shape, or form, however menial that may be. Um, and I think that what that, and through my own experience, I, I mean, I often say to people, just look at your path, look retrospectively, look over your shoulder, look where you've been and look what's happened. Why did you meet that person, where it led you to? And there's almost always a distinctive pattern there that leads you uh, leads you to that. And I think that when it comes to um, the this way, anyone can stand on the street corner and go blah, 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 talk about their beliefs and their philosophies. Anyone can do that. But I think the most powerful way that we can um, create a message in the world today, Julia, is to be the example of what you believe, to become the walking, talking billboard of your philosophy and of your belief. It's not just words, it's your actions, it's how you live your life, it's, it's how you create your renown. I'm very, you know, very humbled and very honoured and privileged to do the work that I do, but a lot of people say to me when they do meet me, they say, gee, I've heard lots about you or I've been following you on social media. You've got a really great energy about you, a nice energy. And I think it's very important for us to be that because none of us can change the world. I wish I could change the young ones and I wish there's many things I wish I could do, but I can only do what I can do in, in, my, in my teachings. And hopefully those teachings um, can reach into far corners of people's lives the way that other great teachers have have uh, uh, impacted my own life because much of what I share and what I teach obviously is what I've learned from other people some of the books I've just shown you what I teach is what I've learned from these guys so we're all messengers you know and I think thankfully conscious awareness across the globe is expanding and it's growing and um, people are asking more and more questions now and thankfully I mean gosh as you can appreciate 30, 40 years ago, all this work that I do now was just almost shunned and not believed. It was still in the dark ages, whereas now people are going, oh, wow, you're a psychic. Whereas before it was like, oh, he's a psychic. Oh, my God, because I steer clear of him. He's a nutcase. He's an absolute nutter. Um, and I'll, you'll, you'll love this. <laughs> I just met a lady recently at one of my shows, and I walked in and she had this crazy look on her face, and she's looking at me, she's craning her neck. And she's sort of leaning forward and she's checked me out. And I thought, God, what's wrong? And I said, are you okay, sweetheart? And she was English. Oh, she said, yeah. She said, oh, no, it's all right. She said, you just look so normal. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what were you expecting? She said, I don't know, but you just look normal. She said, a flower man reads flowers. I thought, oh, I can't wait to see what he looks like. <laughs> you know? She said, but you look so normal. <laughs> I said, I don't know what you're expecting. It was funny. God, I cracked up. And uh, the hostess said, oh, for God's sake, I'll forget it. I call her Mary. Mary, God, David's all right. You know, she said, oh, just, 
you look so normal. You know, you spend like this mystic psychic. I should have come with all the all the purple and all the jewels and jingles and all, like a walked in like a gypsy or something. I think she would have been much more impressed. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. You're very generous with your teaching. So if people are listening from overseas and they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way that they can do that? Okay. You can uh, reach me uh, by my email, flower readings, all lowercase one word, F-L-O-W-E-R-R-E-A-D-I-N-G-S at gmail.com. Uh, that's the easiest way. And that is my office uh, contact. Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y. Tracy is my lovely assistant. And uh, you can address all your inquiries to Tracy and uh, she can give you um, all the uh, the details of uh, how I do all my all my work. So, uh, yeah, that's how that is there. And for the lo for our local people here in Australia, uh, the office number is 0481 598 520. And uh, Tracy can answer your calls and queries uh, if, uh, if you feel inclined to ring. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, David. And we'll just say a quick hi to our audience today. So we've had Julie, Elizabeth, Helen, Charlie, Dingley, and um, Lee Smith. Drop oh, in Lee. Lee. Hey. How are you, Lee? Good to see you, mate. Yes. Lee's a great guy. Lee and Nelly, love and hugs to you both, guys. Right. You're bloody brilliant, brother. So... Um... Thank Thanks you. for joining us and uh, sharing your uh, wisdom and um, more importantly about um, current circumstances and um, how to get in touch with yourself and your own intuition and get away from the narrative that's um, being promoted by um, an insidious... Um, yeah, uh, uh, insidious agenda. And this is why it is so important, guys, for us to, to go within to go within because they're trying to can to disconnect us from our higher self. That's what they're trying to do. They they really they're just trying to interrupt the natural process of connection here. That's why we are being bombarded with so much rubbish and um, and um, propaganda and and distraction. I see distraction everywhere. I think oh, there's a distraction. That's a distraction. Just that there's just so much distraction. But sadly, people just get so caught up. In this distraction, I mean, sadly, well, the sad reality is many aspects of life is all smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of smoke and mirror stuff that goes on, and we've just got to we've got to question what the narrative and question what we're being told and what we're being shown, and particularly what's the source. And if you're being told something or shown something, well, okay, what's the source and what's the where's the credential behind it? What's where are the facts? What's it up? You know, so uh, and is it you know, and the agenda. We all we all know there's an agenda here, but I don't know. It's a funny thing. I can remember something Denise told me many years ago. I won't tell you. I won't take too much longer. But she said to me, I'll never forget. I must have been about 28 or 29. She sat me down one day with a cup of tea and she said, "Sweetheart, I need to tell you something." I said, "What?" She said, "You are going to embark on a path in life that is very unique to a lot of people." I said, "Really? What do you mean by that?" She uh, she knew, but she said, "Well." Put it this way, she said, you will find a path, you'll find yourself on a path, a path of no return. There's no turning back because once you're on this path, once you said you will never turn back. She said there will be a time when you will become known by many, many, many people, but there will be a time on this journey when you will also feel very lonely and not many people will get you, get you, not many people will understand you, and not many people will understand or even believe your philosophy, and that is going to be one of your big challenges. Your big challenge is to believe in you and to believe in your path and believe what your guidance gives you and not what the outside world tells you. And, my God, that was 30-something years ago, and that's exactly where I am now. That's exactly where I am. You know, I my biggest problem in this work is biting the tongue because there's so much I want to say and can say and wish I could say, but because I have quite a high public profile, there's much that I won't say because I know it'll upset the apple cart with some people and people will disagree with me, and that's fair enough too, but I'm not interested in engaging in arguments or debates. It's just that I have to stand true to myself and my word, and if people choose their path, um, you know, whatever it is, I, I also understand that from a sole contract point of view, if people choose whatever they choose to do in life, 
if we're talking about the current situation, if it's vaccinations or whatever they want to do, well, hey, that's their choice. It's their path and it's their journey. I'm powerless to stop them from doing so. And that's obviously in their sole contract to experience all the things that they are going to experience. But for me, no, there's there's much more. I mean, my uh, my connection to my universal connection is screaming at me uh, right now is still not screaming at me, but I, I <laughs> right from the get go of this. I mean, and the other thing is too. I've been been closely aligned with all of this stuff for quite some years. This is this hasn't come up just in the last twelve months. I've I've been investigating a lot of this behind the scenes stuff for probably nearly twenty years now. So all the things that are happening in the world is exactly as it was purported to be all that time ago. So it's no news to me, but. That's why we have to become spiritually prepared and spiritually awakened and, and uh, I call it your spiritual armour. We have to uh, have to become very, very strong because it's a you know, challenging time and we are in a spiritual war, as we all understand, and that's what it's about. I mean, at the moment, as I sit here and look outside, it's dark. We've got a dark cloud sky, a, a dark sky. It's night time. But you know what? Um, there's... You can't have light without dark. You can't have dark without light. So we're going through a, a big transition at this particular point of time, and uh, hopefully we're going to come out at the end uh, shining a lot brighter than what we currently are. Very good. And we'll know what we're made of. <laughs> yes, it, darling. We have had some jewels. We we are we are really finding out what we're made of. And even now, I think, oh my God, I shouldn't say this or think this or do this, but because that's the the human side of you comes out, you just think you get frustrated. But, but sometimes I think, no, 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 just take a step back. Just remember, control what you can control and let go of what you can't control because one thing that's going to change, tip the balance, is the conscious mindset. This is where the war starts, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the energetic um, shift that takes place, it's what we put out there consciously. That's what's going to contribute to all of this, you know. Um, this is where it starts, that, that powerful mindset that we uh, expand upon, you know, and send out to the world. So I think that's what uh, that's what it's all about. Mm. Well, that's great. So we've, um, we'll continue to follow our path and um, we'll dream of a unified future and work on our well, inner worlds in the meantime. <laughs> that's it. And do you know what, I, the thing is, there, this is what's wonderful. This is what's exciting for me. I'm seeing a lot of like-minded people like you and I, Jeff, that like us, we're coming together. I call it the tribe. The tribe's coming together and, and we're coming together in a, in a, in a big way. You know, this is the, this is the unified uh, force of humanity that's coming through and we're understanding what, what's at play here. And, uh, and our contribution to that can never be underestimated in that conscious sense, you know? So, it's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. And thank you, Julia. It's been so lovely to meet you, honey. I'm sorry. I, uh, I should have warned you. You'll get, you'll get about uh, two seconds to speak. <laughs> I've been well, I'm I thought, happy with that. <laughs> I thought oh, you've probably got 100 questions there you wanted to ask me, but I haven't. I just, I think, oh, I've got a story. Oh, I've got an anecdote. Oh, I've got something to tell you here. So, yeah, I mean, as you can appreciate, over all these years, there's just endless stories and anecdotes that uh, that I can share. But um, but it's all good stuff and it leaves me in a very comfortable spot with who I am, with where I am in my life, with all my bids, bolts, my, my faults, my frailties, all my novelty bits and all my happy bits. I'm pretty happy. It's all good. Okay. Okay, Thank you very much for sharing, sharing 